Well, good morning, church. Welcome to, to, welcome to worship this morning. The Bible says in Romans 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. We're here to celebrate Jesus this morning. We invite you to join us. at 5 p.m. we will be hosting a night for New York. Tickets are $10 and include a spaghetti dinner, drink, and dessert. There will also be a live pie and baked goods auction and a silent auction. Entertainment will include crowd participation games as well as family feud. Please make plans to attend and see a New York Mission Team member for tickets. Ladies, you are invited to join us on May the 6th from 1 to 3 p.m. for our Titus 2 tea. Tickets are $10 per person and are now on sale at the Welcome Center and online. And don't forget to wear your favorite hat or fascinator. Mega Hobby Camp and VBS Volunteers. Be sure to join us on April 30th right after the 
second service for our lunch meeting. We will be tie-dyeing t-shirts for Mega Camp and VBS. The VBS volunteers will have a short informational meeting with Miss Charity. We are still looking for volunteers. If you are interested in helping with Mega Camp or VBS, please visit the Kids Check-In Desk or email Heather at firstjoplin.org. Men, join us for our next breakfast and Bible study, Saturday, April 29th at 8 a.m. We will be continuing our Letters from Dad, Lessons from the Tackle Box study. See you then. I've had so many people ask me when our next First Look Lunch is going to be so they can learn about the mission, structure, and vision of First Baptist. They're eager to ask questions and meet the staff. Sunday, May 7th is the day. Lunch and child care will be provided right after the second service in the East Room. If you're planning to attend, email heather at firstjoplin.org or call the church office in RSVP. Our next quarterly business meeting will be Sunday, April 23rd at 6 p.m. here in the Worship Center. Child care will be available for nursery to second grade. Church family, we have been talking about Vision Pittsburgh for a long time, and I hope you'll make plans to be at our quarterly business meeting tonight at 6 p.m. It is going to be exciting. You're going to get to hear about the plans for a new church plant in the nearby community of Pittsburgh that's been in the making for a long time, and you'll have an opportunity to to vote to move forward in this great, great commission work. Well, good morning, First Baptist. It is great. I'm so thankful that I got a couple over there sitting in my section. I was starting to feel a little weird. I was over there and no one was there. No one. Like people would walk up and look and go, oh no. <laughs> I'd rather sit on the front row than over there with the pastor. Anyway, so glad to have each one of you here. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1 this morning. We're going to be finishing our series uh, that we started looking at Good Friday, uh, then Palm, or Palm Sunday, then Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and then the Great Commission. Now we're going to see the mission, the Great Mission, what Jesus, how Jesus outlined for the church to accomplish the Great Commission. We know what the Great Commission is. What did that look like? What was that pattern he put out in front of them? I do hope you will attend tonight's quarterly business meeting. Um, man, you know what? Just consider it date night. Um, if you're interested, just come on out, spend the night, with, spend the uh, evening with us. Um, we're going to be able to, and even if you're not a member, even though uh, anybody is welcome to come, only members are allowed to vote, um, but we encourage you, if you've been kind of checking the church out, kind of wondering, um, we'd love for you to come and see how we do business. And tonight, as you heard on that announcement, um, we get to hear the outline, the plan, a potential timeline, and the church actually has an opportunity tonight to be able to take official action to begin that process, uh, to begin planting a church in Pittsburgh. So it is incredibly exciting. I hope you'll be able to be here. I, I know some of you may have questions. Uh, tonight will be a great opportunity for you to be able to ask questions and have those answered. Um, I know Jess will sla uh, slash my tires if I do not remind you about that uh, April 29th. Jess, you wouldn't slash my tires. You'd have a student do it. Right. Um, anyway, the, the, to notice and, and all that information about the New York City mission trip, um, I hope you are excited about that and are prepared to help support some students in that mission trip, that life-changing mission trip. But in order to do that, if you want information about that August tw or April 29th, it should be in your bulletin. Um, you, you should have it on your app. Uh, you, you saw it on the screen, Facebook. All that information is there. Jess, Nicole, would you raise your hands? There's Jess and Nicole right there. If you have any more questions about that, please grab a hold of them after service, and they would love to answer any questions you have about that food night. Also, if you are one of our first-time guests, we are so, so glad that you have chosen to come in here and worship with us this morning. You'll see up on the screen, there's a QR code. I just showed somebody how to do that earlier, so I know it works. At least the link worked as of 10 minutes ago. Uh, so if you're a first-time guest, you can scan that QR code. You can fill out the Connect card. Last week, I had several families uh, signify by Connect card that they wanted to be a part of a family group. Um, so we followed up on that this week. If you're interested or want to communicate with the staff, a prayer need, a decision you've made, a decision you need to make, uh, anything that you need, man, use that Connect card. Please fill that out, hand it to me, put it in the black box, give it to one of our greeters, whatever you can do, we will be sure and get that Connect card. Also, this is the time of the service that we do continue our worship through our giving. And First Baptist, I want to thank you for continuing to be faithful in your giving. And as you see, we have several ways to be able to give. Anytime during the worship service, uh, you can come up and place your offering in one of these uh, plates along the front, or you can utilize the black box 
back by the door. I know some people, I don't know who, but I know, I know some people give um, through uh, the electronic, through our giving app, um, or through the mail. But I just pray that we would be faithful. It's not just about giving money, it's about first giving our hearts. And I pray that that would be where we really are as we choose to give through worship. But I am so glad you are here, and I'm going to ask you if you would pause with me for a moment as we prepare to continue worship and pray. God, we don't have to ask you to come into this place because you're already here. And Father, I'm thankful that even this morning I've been able to see expressions of Jesus in the lives, in the words, and in the encouragements, Father, of your followers. I am thankful this morning that we are literally surrounded by you in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives in every believer here. And Father, what a joy this is. What a what truly a foretaste of glory divine this is. And Father, if this can be so joyful to be around other believers, I can only imagine what heaven will be like. But until then, Father, you've given us work to do. And I pray that our time together, though brief, I pray that it will equip us and empower us, direct us into your will. For those that have come in here this morning, Father, maybe reluctantly, I pray that they would catch a glimpse of an amazing, resurrected, good, and glorified Jesus, and that that glimpse would change their life. Father, I pray for the remainder of this service that all things that are said and done and thought and sung would be to the glory of the only name that truly matters, and that's Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship him together, church. Jesus said in John chapter 9 who he is. We sang this morning who he is. He's our God. He loves us. He saves us. And in response to that, how do we live? And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will be able to snatch them out of my hands. That's the confidence. That's the hope that we worship in this morning. If you're here this morning, you don't know that confidence. You don't know who Jesus is. I can tell you it's been our prayers leading up to this service and this day that God would use today to draw you closer to him and into a relationship with him. Church, let's worship Jesus for what he's done and who he is. All my words fall sure. I've got nothing new. How could I my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you never do so I throw up my hand I praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a
Jesus, we thank you that we can gather here today in that beautiful, wonderful, powerful name that's above every name, King Jesus. God, we give you this time, we give you the honor and praise that you so richly deserve. As we look into your word, God, I pray you would change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In some of the final words to his disciples, Jesus told his followers what to do. He reminded them and us of his power and promised his presence as we live out the commissioning. But how did they do it? How did they blanket the land with the good news and make disciples? A better question might be, how do we do it today? Spoiler alert, it's the same. What a powerful morning of worship. Would you agree? I'm thankful that we are able to provide an online viewing of the worship service, but there is nothing like being here in person, uh, worshiping together. Would you agree, church? Amen. Amen. So we're ending this series. Next series we're going to be beginning, we're going to be beginning um, here at the church is about the table and how Jesus used meals and how he used food. Amen food. He used food to convey kingdom truths, and there's going to be some unique challenges for each of us to consider um, every week in, the, in this upcoming series, uh, speaking about Jesus utilizing the table as a mission and the use of food. But this morning, we want to close out our previous series that began um, back with Good Friday, and then or Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter, and then the Great Commission. Now we want to see How did Jesus organize, how did he tell them to go about the Great Commission? We know what they were supposed to do, teaching them all things whatsoever I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, making disciples. But now, where were they supposed to go? And we're going to find that in Acts chapter 1, verse 11. So we conveniently move from the Great Commission now to what I would like to call the Great Mission. This is what the church was doing. In Acts chapter 1, the first 11 verses of this great book. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when He had said these things, as they were looking on, He was lifted up, and a cloud took Him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as He went, Behold, two men stood by in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Acts chapter, or the book of Acts is actually the sequel, if you want to think of it, the second of two volumes of Luke's account of the life of Jesus. And if you notice, he says in the introduction of the book of Acts that I recounted to you, Theophilus, whether this was a a real person, an individual, or whether he was using that title to describe a group of believers, uh, we're we're not exactly sure. But for the sake of this, we will say that it was for a person. And Luke is now has written these two volumes, and he dedicates, he, he introduces this second volume, the book of Acts, in describing what took place after Jesus ascended. And it's appropriately called the Acts of the Apostles. 
And I just want to pause there for a minute because I think sometimes in our Christian cultures we become so familiar with book names that we may forget this particular significance. And I think that there is a real significance for us in the name Acts of the Apostles because it was not just for Luke to describe what Jesus had taught. It was not just for Jesus to describe what was going to happen in the future. It was not just for Jesus to provide these kingdom principles on which they would build their lives. What we find in the book of Acts is that Jesus has commissioned the disciples, told them where to go, and then the remainder of the book, the remainder of this incredibly accurate historical account reveals the acts of the apostles. And I think sometimes as believers, we become very comfortable in, in remembering when Jesus lived and reading about his teachings and reading about his suffering and reading about his resurrection and even reading about his great commission. And though we should love that and though that should be a part of our regular diet as a follower of Christ, I think it's also important that we remember that those that Jesus commissioned did something. Those that Jesus poured into gave their lives for him. There was an action that resulted from their faith. And I think sometimes we may be tempted to divorce those. We may try to uh, insist that we have faith, but no works, as James said. James says faith without works is what? Dead. Here, we don't see dead. We see living. We see acts. We see things that are done in the name of Jesus, bearing witness of him in his power. And it reminds us that our faith should be translated into action. There are two words I want, want you to be able to see in, verses, in verse 8. By the way, did you notice in verse 6, they said, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to us now? Even at the very end, they thought it was coming. Jesus doesn't say, I'm not giving you a kingdom right now. I'm giving you a commission. In verse 8, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What do you think about that word for a moment, power? What Jesus is about to tell the apostles before he is ascended is something of such a great magnitude they would not be able to do it in their lifetime and they would not be able to finish it in their own strength. What Jesus was calling them to do was something that they would have to rely on his power to be able to do. And he promises them that. I want you to stay in Jerusalem, he said, until you receive the promise of my Father. We know that that happened shortly after at Pentecost, when the Spirit descended on the believers in the upper room. And the gospel, as we sing the song, the, that, that the Spirit lit the flame, that's when the, the church was truly born as the Spirit of God was upon those believers. And they began preaching, and they began teaching, and they began making disciples of all nations. That's when that happens in Acts chapter 2. But here Jesus says, you will receive power. And all through the book of Acts, you see their power. You see God performing powerful miracles. You see apostles going out and proclaiming powerfully and boldly the Word of God. You see a powerful love that they are demonstrating, a life-changing love among the community of believers. You see them, in the words of the book of Acts, literally turning the world upside down because of the power of God. We cannot divorce the purpose of God from the power of God. We remember last week in the Great Commission, before he ever told him what to do, he said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, because of the authority, which is not just the power, but the right to use that power, Jesus says, in light of that, go. The second word is witness. I think sometimes we may get, we get kind of convoluted on what we're supposed to do. Think about that word witness. Jesus tells them, you're going to receive power to do what I'm telling you to do, and what I'm telling you to do is to be witnesses. I want you to bear witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to tell other people about me. I want you to show other people about me. I want you to go doing that, and as you go, you are going to be a witness, a billboard, your job is to shine a spotlight on Jesus Christ. That's still our job today. Thankfully, every born-again believer has that same powerful Holy Spirit in that person living inside of us. He has equipped us to live the life that He's called us to live. He has equipped us through the Spirit and the spiritual gifts 
to do what He's called us and made us to do. And that is to bear witness of Jesus. Power and witness. We're going to look at four places that Jesus outlines for them. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And that's what He told them to do. And we know that they were not able to accomplish all of that. But I also believe that this is a great model for a church. Now, this is descriptive, not prescriptive, but I think that we as a church can look back, and we have looked back and said, are we able to take Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and see that as a scalable model for how our church does missions? And, and we have, and I'll explain that moving forward. But I think it's also not just a good scalable model for a church. I think it's a good scalable model for us as individual followers of Christ, that we can look at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth and say, God, what does that mean for me and for my witness? So this morning, we're looking at it through three lenses. One lens is how did the church accomplish that? Second is how can our church accomplish that? And third is what does that look like for me on an individual level? Number one, Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. Well, that's easy, right? That's where we are. That's where they were. Jesus told us to stay in Jerusalem. So he's making it seemingly pretty easy for him. I want you to stay in Jerusalem until you've received power or the promise of my Father, and then you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem. So what Jesus is telling them is I want you to start being a witness for me right here where you are. He didn't call them to go somewhere else first. He called them to be witnesses of Jesus right where they are. Now let me ask you, where is our Jerusalem as a church? Joplin. Yes, absolutely. Joplin is our Jerusalem. We have a responsibility. If we're going to scale this down and use this as a model for church missions, we ought to be able to say, where is my Jerusalem? And we would all agree that our Jerusalem is Joplin. This is the community that we need to be able to start our missions in. We need to be witnesses of Him. Thankfully, we are. We're witnesses. You're all witnesses when you go to your jobs. You are all witnesses when you go to your schools. You are all witnesses when you go with your social clubs and circles and, and, and run with the people that you run with. I believe you're probably witnesses in your hobbies. I hope that you're witnesses and you take, this, that you take your following of Christ to be so serious that it's not a Sunday thing, but it's a seven days a week thing. And that throughout your life and the various circles you're in, that you would utilize that as an opportunity to bear witness in the power of God, of the goodness of God. But I believe that there's something else there. I believe that not just as a church are we bearing witness here, but as an individual. What does this mean for me? I believe what this means for me, if I want to scale that down all the way as an individual, this would tell me that my mission, my witness for Jesus Christ needs to begin right here. It needs to begin with me. It needs to begin with my family needs to be in my home. That's where that needs to start. The, Jerusalem is our hometown. Je Joplin is our hometown. It only makes sense that if I'm scaling this down, I want to say to, I want to, say to the Lord, I want to ask this question of the Lord, God, am I being a faithful witness of Jesus in my home? You may find this morning that your mission field is not across a sea. You may find this morning that your mission field is not necessarily across the street yet. Your mission field may very well be across the table. That may be... You may say this morning, you know what? I'm like so many others. I go to church. I listen. I amen. I participate. But I go home and I'm a different person. I'm not bearing witness of the things I've seen. Jesus made clear that you're going to witness where you are. You're going to start right there in Jerusalem. That's where I want you to be. 
Did you notice they weren't called to stay there? We want to. It's always been about expansion. That's always been God's dream. Do you remember what he, it's always been God's plan? Do you remember what he told Abraham? He told him he'd be a father of many nations. That his children would be, that all nations of the earth would be blessed through him. It's not a surprise. God's not just throwing in this audible at the last minute, say, oh, you know what, it's not just about you. I want this to go to the whole world now. No, the, the, the globe was on Jesus' mind from the very beginning. You may remember that at the Tower of Babel, they wanted to form this community. They wanted to build a tower. They wanted to have a city. They wanted to stay when God said, go and and populate and multiply upon the face of the whole earth. They wanted to do that. They wanted to form that city. Why? Because it's convenient. It's comfortable. It's easy. But the gospel, the witness of Jesus Christ was not supposed to just stay In Jerusalem, and truth be told, every one of us in our hearts should say a hearty amen over that. Aren't you thankful that you and I don't have to go to Jerusalem to become a disciple? I am. I don't have to travel to Jerusalem to hear about Jesus. Thankfully, somebody left Jerusalem, went to Judea and then to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And somebody impacted my great, 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 great grandparents It caused a legacy to come down of people that were coming into my life. Parents that were proclaiming the truth to me. I'm thankful that the gospel has reached even to me. It's convenient to stay. It's convenient for us to say, you know what, I minister in my own home. I'm a witness in my own home, but not to go outside of that. And that's what Jesus calls them to do. I want you to just be a witness of me in Jerusalem. I want you to be a witness to me in all Judea. If you think of Jerusalem as the city, Judea would be what we would think of as a state. The gospel had to cross boundaries. Now, it would be really cool if we opened in the Bible and saw by Luke's account that all these believers in Jerusalem are praying one night. And they're all praying, and all of a sudden, it'd be cool if we read that the place was shaken, right? We like that in the book of Acts. It adds a nice touch to my story. Wouldn't that be cool if they were all praying right there, and they're like, okay, you know what, Jerusalem, we got that. God's telling us now to go to Judea, spread out. Or I would love to tell you that what if some of the apostles come and like, you know what, we got Jerusalem covered now, let's go out to Judea. That'd be awesome if that was how that happened, if if man thought of it and remembered those words of Jesus and went out and and started advancing naturally, or the Spirit was to just tell them, go now, it's time, you've got Jerusalem, go. But that's not what happened. That's not at all how it happened. I want you to see a scripture that's going to be up on on the screen. It's out of this book, book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. The church has grown disciples or uh, uh, deacons have been, uh, the office of the deacon has been born as servants in the church. And one of those deacons, Stephen, begins proclaiming the gospel to people who didn't want to hear it. They became so angry at him, they decided to stone him, kill him with stones. And this picks up at the end after Stephen is dead. Chapter 8, verse 1 through 5, and Saul approved of his execution. Saul, who would later, later become Paul, approved of the execution of Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. How did God get him out of Jerusalem? He allowed the fires of persecution to send them everywhere. Now, this is not necessarily a statement that they were reluctant to leave Jerusalem. That's not what I'm trying to communicate. I'm trying to communicate in my life, I am tempted sometimes to not grow and to not step outside of my 
comfortable circles, and God has every right as sovereign Lord to use whatever means He wants to use in order for me to expand that circle of influence. And here in the historical account, isn't it funny that the enemy, the devil, and all of his dark forces thought he was going to stamp out this fire of the gospel? Aren't you glad to know that just as he was stamping it, trying to put it out, he was only spreading the flames further. God continued to use. Guys, I don't know. I don't know where your boundaries are. But that next one, Judea, is important because it's taking one more step. It's talking to one other person. Somebody outside of your circle being able to have a conversation, bear witness, do something to witness to Jesus Christ, to somebody you may never have done before. Number three, the gospel didn't just have to cross boundaries in order for this to be accomplished. It had to cross cultures and prejudices. Number three is Samaria. If you've been around church or read the Bible much, you probably know that Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, and vice versa. They did not like each other. There was hatred, animosity, prejudices. A good Jew would not be found in Samaria. A good Jew just to the north of Samaria of Judea, a good Jew in that day would have walked around Samaria, didn't even want to go in it. You might remember what a scandal that was when Jesus in the Gospel of John said, I must needs go into Samaria, and he walks into Samaria with his disciples. That was a cultural no-no, but he had to go. And there as he goes into Samaria, do you remember he talked to a woman, another cultural no-no. Jesus was, doing a, was, was committing some kind of a cultural scandal by going into Samaria because no other Jew would do that, but Jesus did. He had to go. He reached that one woman, and that one woman reached her entire village, or was used by Christ to reach the entire village. Sometimes our witness, we're called to not just cross boundaries, but to cross cultures. We're called to witness to those people that don't look like us, that don't act like us, that don't do what we would do. We're called to be a witness to those people that don't vote like us. And sometimes that's hard. But I promise you the good news is by far greater than any bad feelings I have about somebody. Can you imagine now that to their credit, Philip does that. First deacon goes down into Samaria and preaches the gospel. Now, he probably didn't have, well, I won't get into all that, but still, he goes into Samaria, that place where where others would have been reluctant before, he goes in and he preaches, and there's a revival that takes place. Friends, you and I are not just called to focus on ourselves, our home, our heart. We're called to expand out into Judea and even to the places that we may normally not want to go. And then finally, the ends of the earth. The gospel didn't just have to cross boundaries and cultures. They had to cross seas. I want to read a passage for you so you know how important that was when Jesus said to the ends of the earth, every tribe, every nation, every tongue. What's called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus, shortly before He is betrayed and killed, He's teaching His disciples Some teachings about the last time. The end days. And I want you to see the Scripture will be on the screen. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 through 14. As He said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately, saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of Your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in My name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. 
All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and be put to death. And then you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And Jesus said this consummation of the age is not going to happen until the gospel has been preached to every tribe, nation, and tongue. What a gracious act of Jesus. You ever feel like those disciples upon hearing what the last times were going to be? Don't you feel like after he said what he said, they're like, okay, never mind, I shouldn't have asked. Wish I never asked. I want to show you a picture up on the screen. This will help you identify a little bit about how the gospel spread throughout the book of Acts of over about the span of 40 to 45 years. You see the red circle down here is Jerusalem, and then the, the blue circle is Judea and Samaria. That takes place um, within the first 13 chapters of the book of Acts. And then the rest of the book of Acts describes all of the expansion of the gospel, all the way out to Rome. It shouldn't surprise us, Galatia, Colossae, Ephesus, Corinth, Thessalonica, Philippi, Rome. It shouldn't surprise us. But let me remind you of this. When you look at that circle, I promise you that was the known world to the Jewish person. That was the known world. Now, they didn't accomplish the ends of the earth, but in their mind, that was the known world. And within 40 to 45 years, the gospel spread that far, and they didn't have Facebook. I'm being totally serious. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have, oh, they didn't have technology. They didn't have telephones. And I promise you, if they did write a text, it got carried by a courier. They had to travel on foot. There was no mail. I mean, when I look at that, let me tell you honestly, when I look at what God did through that group of people who were empowered by the Holy Spirit and bore witness, and to see that great circle of influence that they had in planting churches, in being a light, in seeing the lives changed through the gospel, when I see what they did in 40-some years, I am humbled. I really am. They really did believe Jesus. They really did understand the power they had. They really did understand the weight and the privilege and the responsibility of being a witness to Jesus. They understood what it was to be kingdom-minded. Jerusalem, yeah, we got that. Judea and all Samaria, yeah. And now we're going to the uttermost parts of the earth. And since for the sake of the map we were using circles, I believe that God in His desire so that none of us would forget what the ultimate end goal is, He drew a circle around ours. This is what we're supposed to accomplish. A little circle right around it. <laughs> but seriously though, in that amount of time, The gospel went that far? Church, did they have more power than we did, than we do? They certainly didn't have all the tools we have. For the life of me, I can't tell you anything else than the fact that they were absolutely sold out on the mission of the commission that Jesus gave them. Started in Jerusalem, went to Samaria, Judea. It crossed boundaries, it crossed cultures, and now it crosses seas. 
Friends, the work is not done. We know that because Jesus hasn't returned. He won't return until every tribe, nation, and tongue has heard the gospel. I'm thankful to be a part of a Southern Baptist church, to know that our cooperative dollars, the dollars we give to missions, goes to support missionaries in places you and I would have not gone and probably can't pronounce. That right now, by your giving, a portion of that giving goes to support missions, both abroad and at home. But I want you to see, go back, with, go back to that map picture, if you would, Austin. I want you to see the names on there. You saw uh, Colossae, Ephesus, Galatia, Corinth, Thessalonica, Philippi. Those should be familiar to us because those are New Testament churches. You see what happened when those believers were born again and discipled, they formed a body, a local body. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake about it. The local church is the main vehicle by which Jesus wants to reach the world with the gospel. The local church is the vehicle. That's what they were planting. Churches. In the year 2000, median worship attendance was 137. It was the median worship attendance in 2007. Today, Median worship is 67. It's quite a drop, wouldn't you agree? What do we do about that? It should not surprise us, friends, that with the rise of secularism, the rise of a group now known as the nuns, they believe nothing, It shouldn't surprise us that as the impact, the influence, the mission of the local church, as that declines, sin abounds. Lostness grows. Darkness advances. I want to apologize to you. I don't know how it happens, but it happens. When you pastor a church, you do it for the right reasons. You want to shepherd the flock. And you want to advance the kingdom. But somewhere in most pastors' lives that I talk to, the temptation comes to want to build a church. We want people to come in. We don't want people to leave. We want them to come in. And somewhere along the lines, we can believe that it's our job to build a church. And it's never been our job to build a church. Jesus said, I will build my church, Jesus said. And before long, if we're not careful as pastors or as church leadership or even as church members, we can think that success in the Great Commission is building a big church. And it's not. My job is not. To build a church. And if I think that's my job, I've missed it. And if I've communicated to you in any way that my job is to build a church, I apologize. That's not it. What God has called me to do, what God has called us to do, is to not build a church, but to grow a kingdom. And that does not look the same. Sure, do I want new people to come in? Yeah, I believe there's a great possibility for discipleship here. I want to make you, I want to be a part of making and forging that person into a disciple. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus said we're to make disciples, but then what did he tell them to do? Send them out. 
What if we were a church that was more concerned about our sending capacity than our seating capacity? What if we were a church that was more concerned about giving people away and planting and investing in the kingdom's work than we were holding on to it? What would happen if we approached our church from such a kingdom mindset that says, I'm not willing to give, I'm willing to invest in the kingdom. Investment is a temporary loss for a future gain. What if we saw it really as sowing seeds? What if we really saw it as I'm taking this seed, I'm planting it in the earth, it is dead to me, and then it will grow and there will be more? What if we took those kingdom principles? Let me share an interesting statistic with you. A man named Jerry Farmer, Jeffrey Farmer, excuse me, in 2007, was doing his dissertation for his PhD, and he researched 624 Southern Baptist churches that had planted churches. 624, because in his dissertation, he wanted to find out what do those sending churches look like five years after they planted a church. For the record, what does planting a church look like? Well, basically this. This is, what it, this is what it's going to cost. It's going to cost money and it's going to cost people. You're going to give away people and you're going to invest money in the cause of that new church. 624 Southern Baptist churches, Jeffrey Farmer Research. Five years after those churches were planted. Do you know what he found out? On average... Every one of those churches grew, on average, by 21.5% in membership. Not 2.15, not 0.215, 21.5. Five years after the church was planted, 21.5% membership growth. All right, pastor, you talked about noses, now talk about nickels, right? Right? Here are the nickels. Five years after the churches were planted, their giving increased too. Designated gifts increased on average by 77%. And their tithes increased by 48%. That doesn't seem right. If we're giving people away, shouldn't it go down? If you're giving your best and your brightest, shouldn't you be at a deficit? There are only two reasons I can explain it. And they're all based off of the fact that God's economy doesn't work like ours. The two reasons are this. I have to believe at some point every one of those 625 churches had to have a renewed zeal for missions. They realized that it was not about bringing people in, but about sending them out. Again, come in. We want to disciple. We want to grow. We want to see you be who Jesus called you to be. And we are happy to be able to invest in the kingdom's work through this church or through some other means. So I believe one is that there was a renewed zeal for mission. Secondly, I have to believe that he who sits on the throne had to say yes. They get it. It is more blessed to give than to receive. It is about the Great Commission. It is about advancing a kingdom. I believe that in those churches, it shouldn't surprise us that God said, yes, you're going to funnel this out into the kingdom. I'm going to use you, and I'm going to bless you. You've heard it before. I can't find it in Scripture, but it's true. You can't outgive God. And church, I don't want to be. I don't want to build a church. It drives me nuts. Pastors are fighting depression and battles and struggles and emotional because they're building a church and we were never called to do it. I don't want to do that. I want to grow a kingdom. I want to advance a kingdom. And tonight, tonight, we get an opportunity to talk about something that has been 16 years in the making. We get to talk about an opportunity to be able to plant a new church. Do you realize within the first five years of First Baptist Joplin's existence, they were worshiping in five different sites? In the first five years, what an incredible missionary zeal. We have an opportunity to be a part of a great kingdom work. Three things. You're here this morning. I have no idea where you are spiritually. You've heard me talking about planting a church. You've heard me talking about witnessing Jesus. If you hear anything this morning, you hear this, please. The gospel of Jesus Christ is worth sharing. 
the good news of Jesus that He saved my soul is worth telling the whole world about. And if you're here this morning, I promise you, I believe you've had somebody witness to you. You've had somebody bear witness of Jesus Christ through their actions, through their words, through their prayers, through their kindness. They've bore witness of what Jesus has done in their life. This morning, that's the first step. First step isn't going. The first step is always coming to Christ. And I pray this morning we'll have counselors along the front. If you've never trusted Christ, and today is that day that you know God is calling you to be a born-again believer, to follow Him, to be saved, I'm going to invite you to come. Church, Christian, will you and I renew our commitment? Will you and I say this morning, if need be, God, I haven't been a witness in my home. God, I haven't been intentional in talking about and sharing and communicating with my own home, my own circle of friends, my job, what you've done in my life, and I want that to change today. And church, will you and I consider that truth that it's not our job to build this church. It's God's job. What He's looking for is people that are going to build His kingdom. And that means going, giving, praying, supporting. Will you and I consider this a moment where this tide is turned and we are not looking in as much as we are looking out? Father, thank you for the reminder of the book of Acts. Thank you, God, for the reminder that you've given us a calling that starts in our own heart and in our own home, but does not stop there. Help us to see the ways that you would have us to expand the boundaries, the borders, to cross cultures, maybe even to cross seas this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was, was lost.
God is continuing to work on hearts, I want to introduce you to Kim, or Martin and Kim Prov Provencal. Provencal. I, I said it right the very first time, and then I tried to church it up. I'm sorry. Uh, Martin Provencal, he wishes to unite with the church by transfer of letter uh, from a sister church in Gravit, Arkansas. What say you, church family? Amen. Amen. We're so glad to have you, Martin and Kim, of course. Kim, Kim has been with us for a long time, and Martin and Kim just recently got married. What are we, about three, four weeks out now? Five. Five, five weeks. It flies. It flies. Well, that was like your first anniversary question, and you nailed it. All right. Well, we're going to let them return to their seats, and, and let, thank you guys so much for being a part. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working.